Well, good evening, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's meeting of Corporate Scrutiny on the 7th of February 2024. Um, first of all, welcome to everybody. Um, obviously, to remind members and officers present, this meeting is being recorded and will be obviously uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, first item on our agenda is apologies for absence. I know we've already had apologies from Councillor Bailey, Councillor Claymore and Councillor Price. Do we have any th further apologies? Do we want to record Councillor Summers' those apologies yeah, as he has yeah, sent yeah. them as, the, yeah. as a portfolio holder? I think that would be fair. Uh, item two is minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, we're looking to approve the minutes held on the 20th of December 2024. Do I have anybody to move those minutes, please? I have a mover from Councillor Bain and a seconder from Councillor Lewis. <coughs> All those in favour? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's just uh, my introduction. <laughs> so, yes, it was December 2023, just to clarify. <laughs> I don't know what year it is. I'm getting old now. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Item three, are there any declarations of interest for tonight's meeting? I note there are none. Item four, uh, update from the chair. Uh, I have no updates as such. Uh, I'll cover that under anything I've got to update under the next items. <coughs> so I'll take us to item five, which is responses to reports of Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Uh, you'll recall uh, that a working group met in November 2023, I've got the year right, uh, to discuss damp and mould. Um, they came up with some uh, three recommendations that obviously were taken back to the main Corporate Scrutiny Committee on the 20th of December 2023, not 24. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's predicted text, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Uh, obviously, uh, I then took those recommendations to Cabinet on the 25th of January. Uh, all three recommendations were approved. Thank you again, Councillor Jay. Uh, however, there was some thought around what constitutes uh, vulnerable people when we're talking damp and mould. And uh, I believe the portfolio and the officers were to take that away and give that some thought. I don't know, uh, Mr Barnes and Mr Weston, you got any update at this meeting? It's not essential if you haven't. I just wonder if that would be given any thought yet. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, still under consideration at the moment, although I would point out that uh, since that meeting, OAB's law has been announced by Michael Gove, and there is some uh, there is mention in there around uh, addressing uh, people with vulnerabilities, particularly where there's health vulnerabilities and the requirements for inspections within 24 hours. So there's a good chance that that's probably already covered by OAB's law anyway. Uh, but like I say, it's something we'll need to look into. Well, they say great minds think alike. <laughs> Okay, I'll take us to, sorry, is there any questions on item five on that update on damp and mould just before I move on? <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again to the working group that pulled those recommendations together. I was absent, so thanks, Dan, for chairing that and a uh, good piece of work, I thought. Thank you. I'll take us to item six, consideration of matters referred to corporate scrutiny. We have none for this meeting, which takes us to item seven, which is the quarter three performance report. We have with us this evening half the officer team and obviously Councillor Jay, the leader of the council. I don't know if you want to kick us off, Councillor Jay. Yep, sure. Thank you for the intro. Um, so as you know, you've seen this uh, every quarter. This provides the committee with an overview of the performance for the third quarter of the 2023-2024 financial year. Um, which is October to December. It reports the position in relation to progress of strategic corporate plan projects, updates on the financial position, corporate risks, audits, information, complaints and complaints. So you're getting an opportunity today to review it, scrutinise it, have any input um, before it gets considered by Cabinet on the 22nd of February. Um, in this report, obviously there's an appendix um, which contains, it's just got some bullets there, quarter three highlights, strategic project finance, basically what I listed a moment ago, including comments, compliments, and complaints. Um, basically, I've, I've had a look, and I think the, you know it, it's looking a lot better, the, the report, which I know has been uh, a testament to a lot of people in this room on the, on the uh, committee, so thank you for your input. Um, there's no big flashing items for me upon review, so I'd welcome your feedback, and uh, it's recommended that this committee endorse the content of this report for consideration by Cabinet. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Jay. Uh, Mr Barrett, anything to add? Not at this stage, Chair. We'll pick up <coughs> any, any questions, but I say if the in the appendix, um, having sort of gone through it, there's nothing that um, looks considerably different than the progress made in, in quarter two. 
Um, I'll probably just ask our Section 151 officer if there's any sort of financial, um, uh, I'll use the word concerns, probably the wrong one, but financial issues that are worthy of merit or any revs and bends um, implications that come by. But generally, I think it shows that um, traction is being made in, uh, in, in the right areas and um, we appear to be uh, to be on track with uh, with what we said we'd do. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose the only point that I'd like to point out on, I hate to refer to page numbers, given my experience of this in the past, page 33 on my report um, it is the, exec, is the sort of general firm revenue summary of expenditure of where we are. just like to point out that the vet out 10 variance at the end of the year has increased to 1.9 million compared to uh, one point, just almost 1.6 million at the quarter two report. Um, that means that the um, increase in the balances that we've got held to 10.3 million, which will feed back into the budget report that we, you'll, you'll, you, you presented at Cabinet um, in a couple of weeks. So, I had to think then. <laughs> so, other than that, I like a lot of the finance issues are much the same as the previous report and nothing outstanding to, to bring to your attention. Thank you very much. As myself and Mr Barrett regularly say, they've been the same financial uh, problems we've had for 10 years. <laughs> we just keep managing them and we keep managing them very well. Okay, uh, that was the introduction. Uh, do we have any questions, comments, debate from the committee? Councillor Bain. Um, through your chair, probably the best person to, to sort of go through this, although, <laughs> so obviously, you know, you've heard about the homelessness hub, you know, that's going to be multi-agency um, support for vulnerable homeless people. So the idea there is it's essentially a kind of open day. I believe there will be the uh, local MP will be coming uh, and then representatives, uh, also the portfolio holder. So on the day, basically, it'd be an opportunity for any members or, or other partners who want to come down, um, have a look at the what what's going to be provided, um, listen to a couple of speeches, and then basically sort of you know have an opportunity to talk to those who'll be sort of delivering the work that will be done there. So that that's the idea of that that particular event. I don't believe so, no. There won't be service users there at that point. <coughs> it's more around a meeting for, you know, partners and anybody who wants, you know, from the organisation who wants to come and sort of learn more about what's going to be offered, uh, an opportunity for the providers to sort of set out the work that they'll be doing. Um, so I'm not aware of any service users being there, um, but uh, I can double-check that if that's uh, if that's of use. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Bain. Mr Barrett wanted to come in first just before you do. Sorry. Yeah, just really, just for, for, for members' information, there is uh, an update on the member zone on the uh, on, on the website, giving the um, the details of it. So uh, it's it's there, and there has been an invite extended to um, to, to all councillors. So it's Friday, ninth um, of Feb, twelve noon at Offer House, which is just opposite the, uh, the our, our offices, and uh, just a little bit of a. Uh, description about what it's what it's about. So it's, it's there on the member zone for, for for members' information. Thank you. Did you want to follow up, Councillor Bain? Any further questions or comments? Okay, uh, one from me then. 
um, obviously um, stated within the report the housing revenue account business plan to be reported to cabinet in february balanced budget longer term horizon scan and choices for tenants and leaseholders obviously the last time we spoke mr barnes about the 30-year hra business plan we did have some concerns <coughs> um, you know towards the end of the plan i think at one point we we're looking at 200 million adrift on the capital projections i just wonder if you can give us an update on roughly where we are on the projections over the 30 years i know we prefer to budget for five years when we have the information but we do tend to do a 30-year hra business plan obviously for long-term scanning of the stock we still possess am i making sense <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think where we are with that work is obviously the, you know, at this point, the um, the financial forecast has been undertaken. Um, when that comes through to cabinet, basically, we'll be um, uh, giving that baseline position, which will show a deficit over that thirty-year period. Um, but with it, with that, we'll now be working on the mitigations and the action plan, uh, which will be a progress, you know, through next year, basically to put in place. Um, the, the decisions and the, the measures that are actually going to help us to balance the HRA business plan over, over that period of time. Obviously, the biggest kind of pressure, and I guess the reason for that, for that sort of uh, deficit over that time, is actually achievement of net zero. Um, and we are you know, still waiting to really understand exactly what's going to be required of, of social landlords. And I think across the sector, it's fair to say that uh, you know, there are not many who are not struggling with the implications of trying to achieve net zero when you put it into the context of that sort of longer term financial forecast. Um, so to be clear, um, you know, the, the, the HRA business plan is, um, is balanced for the next um, number of years, um, but we will be reporting through the budget process over the 30 year period, um, you know, for this financial year, we'll be forecasting a deficit uh, and then putting forward those plans um, to explore mitigations um, going forward. Um, but as I say, that with that, with that pressure of net zero, I think that's going to continue to be a difficult, um, unbalanced sort of position um, for, you know, for the time being until we get clarity on that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. And another one from me, sorry. Obviously, asset management strategy, um, due date 31st of March 2024. I know this has been through ISAG, but it came through corporate last year. I'm not saying it should have come through corporate, that's not my point. Obviously, just an issue I raised last time we looked at the asset management strategy, I didn't see the word depreciation anywhere in it. I just wondered, have we fixed that? And obviously, have we got depreciation in it now, Mr. Weston? Still finalising the, the final draft on that, ready to bring to one of the scrutiny groups before it goes to Cabinet. But yeah, that's obviously one of the recommendations. I think there were some other things in there that came out of it as well. I can't remember offhand what those are, but I've got them listed so that they'll all be incorporated into it. Yeah, as you'll recall, my concern was obviously in an asset strategy, you've got to take account of depreciation of your assets. So if that's now included, obviously I'm satisfied. And sorry, uh, last one for me, obviously. Uh, I know it's going to full council on the, uh, in about a month, obviously future high streets fund. Obviously there's comments in here about adjustments to the future high streets fund budget. If the answer is going to be it's commercially sensitive, I'm happy to take that offline, but I just wondered if you can give us an update on where that is. <coughs> I'm happy to come in there. Um, so it's a similar position to what we, we talked about offline quite a few months back now with the group leaders. Uh, we've now got some more up-to-date information, up-to-date costings, etc. Um, it is obviously commercially sensitive, but you'll get to review that before it comes to full council because we have to make a decision at that point. That's absolutely fine, Councillor Jay. Happy to do that where it is. There, there is a commercial sensitivity <coughs> to it that I fully respect. So yeah, I just thought, as it's mentioned in the report, I'll just raise it. Um, as, as Mr Barrett rightly said, a lot of this information marries what we've already discussed in quarter two. Nothing jumps out of these papers that's given me any cause for alarm. So I'm happy if committee's happy to move the recommendation. That's not to shut down any debate, but at this point I'm happy to move the recommendation that we endorse and send it off to Cabinet for the next stage of the process. Seconded by Councillor Doyle, but if anybody else has anything they want to raise, while we have officers of <coughs> Councillor Jay here, Councillor Bain.
just before I fetch in Mr Barrett and Councillor Jay, um, it's actually a tragedy of the 1960s, some of these problems, that when we built a lot of the estates in the 1960s, we planted a lot of birch trees, <coughs> which grow very fast, are very beautiful, but their roots are incredibly damaging. And this was before the times of root barriers, and we're now trying as councillors now to deal with those decisions from the 1960s. And it is our HRA estates where a lot of these tree problems are, you're absolutely correct, and it's an ongoing problem. I think we looked into it a few years ago, I think we needed somewhere in the middle of three million pounds to completely solve the problem. It, it is a problem, you're correct. But Councillor James to Barrett, whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I'll come in with what's, what will probably be a partial answer and then let Mr Barrett uh, complement it. Um, so part of the issue is uh, sort of backlog and time it's taking. So in the budget, there's an, uh, a new arborist, that's how you say it, isn't it? Arborist. And um, a new street scene team with three people and a van as well. So there's more resource, because this year we've seen even when there has been a tree issue that's been identified and the plan is to cut it down, it's taken eight, nine, ten months to do it because of backlog. So that's in the budget to try and resolve that part of it. And I'll hand over to Mr Barrett for the strategy part. Thank you, Councillor Day. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I actually wasn't going to answer your question. I was going to say, would it be useful if I get um, our new Assistant Director, <coughs> um, Hannah Pete, to give you a call? Um, and then she can explain how we deal with trees. might be useful as a, as, as a briefing. Um, she's the, the responsible AD for that service area. So it'll probably um, aid your knowledge of what we do and uh, perhaps understand it more. If that's useful. Councillor Jay. Yeah, I'd second that being a councillor wide briefing. I think that'd be a good idea. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Doyle. Um, coming in on that tree one, uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea that in the briefing you include the use of Terra Nova because most of my colleagues that I speak to don't know how to use it, or don't even know that it exists. And that actually can be quite useful in establishing which is a legitimate tree and which isn't. Uh, to be honest, I think there should be a review of the policy as well, because I don't think it goes far enough. And I also don't think the budget <coughs> allocation is enough either. Uh, going back to what you said, Danny, uh, about the review, I was the one that actually asked for it and found that we were underfunded for it. I'd really like to see that change. Thank you. Uh, if Council Ben and Council Dahl wish, we've got a meeting on the 7th of March where we need to populate an agenda at some point in this meeting. Do you want to put that on the agenda? Yeah. Leanne? That be okay, Mr Barrett? I don't think you'll get much content in three weeks, yeah, to be quite frank with you. I'll set that up and I mean, it needs it needs to be meaningful if it's going you know if, if it's going to happen. So I think you know, and, and in fairness to officer workload, it isn't something we can just sort of con, you know conjure up. I think it does you know if, if we're going to do it, do it, let's do it justice. Okay. Uh, we'll take that offline, Mr. Barrett, and we'll see whether we can do it on seventh of March. I recommend we put it on the agenda for next year's committee. In, in fairness, chair, yeah, thinking ahead, it might it, it's quite logical to recommend it for next year's committee thinking that if there are any budget implications, they can then be fed into the budget process as a policy change going forward, rather than trying to shoehorn something into, into something that perhaps isn't there. That would be a, a, you know, a, a, probably a more constructive way, I think, of, of dealing with it, if the committee would be happy with that as a, you know, as a, as a way forward. OK, <coughs> like I say, we'll take it offline and quickly start it out in our brief committee on how we can approach that. But as has been raised, it's, it's an issue I think scrutiny can look at, whether it's the next meeting or next year. We'll take it offline and we'll do it, we'll do it justice, like you say, Mr Barrett. Thank you. OK, it's been moved and seconded that we endorse and send off to Cabinet. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, any officers are welcome to leave us, and also Councillor Jay. I know you're feeling a little bit under weather, so we really do appreciate your attendance. If you want to shoot off home now and have a hot bath, you carry on, sir. <laughs>
Okay, at that point, I'll take us to item eight on our agenda. Update on Assure implementation. Uh, you'll recall at corporate scrutiny just about a year ago, this was raised, obviously flagged through the quarterly performance report that there were issues with Assure and getting it launched in, before we lose the support for the M3 system that currently supports our environmental health team. And I believe we have an update tonight, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I'm going to start before handing over to um, Wendy and Gareth. Um, before I start, could I just, for correctness, um, the agenda came out with two portfolio holders' names on. Could I just correct it? It wasn't the portfolio holder of housing and planning on the report, just the Environmental Health and Community Partnerships portfolio holder. So for correctness for the minute, thank you. So, Danny, you very succinctly put the reason that we've brought um, the um, team here. So I am going to let them give you the technical detail about where we've come but what I can say from where our conversation nearly a year ago um, we have come on leaps and bounds in order to um, move the M3 system over to Assure so I think Wendy's probably going to start off is she yeah thank you thank you Zoe um, in summary environmental health are progressing well uh, we have an officer dedicated to systems administration working three days a week progressing the transition from M3 to Assure we're well underway with setting up the configuration for licensing with inquiries, licenses and inspections working in the test system. Training from NEC on the reporting side of the systems pending and once this is completed, Environmental Health will be able to set this up in the test system. At that stage, we'll be able to set a date for the licensing side of Assure to go live. It's anticipated that the licensing workload will be ready for transitioning to Assure in early March. Once licensing is live, we can then replicate what's been completed there on the wider tasking of the department. In terms of our letters and documents being loaded onto the system, we've analysed the usage of those documents, uh, called them significantly on the M3 system, removing any documents we no longer use and prioritising them for their, uh, on the basis of their most usage. Environmental Health are currently on track that all documents for licensing will be available on Assure for any anticipated live go date. Uh, and then the wider documentation will be available for our main go live date. In terms of meeting the de-support date, licensing workload probably represents approximately 75% of the environmental health workload that needs to transition. So the aim is to ensure the transition is before the de-support uh, de deadline of March the 31st. The team are confident that the remaining 25% can be dealt with swiftly and a phased approach uh, to the workload will flow from the licensing transition. The risk associated with the remaining 25% is much lower and the team are confident that this will be dealt with quickly. Thank you very much, Wendy. Gareth, anything to follow up with? It's just a short update from IT, really. Um, at the end of last year, we um, brought the environment, the insure, and then three environment right up to date. The application versions so that users have all got the latest functionality, uh, server and database platforms so we can maintain security updates and support uh, through the duration of the project. Um, and then next week we've got some work going on uh, to improve, uh, to further improve the security of the system. So um, the way, when it was installed, it was installed uh, so that the users uh, didn't use an encrypted connection between them and the uh, application. Uh, that's fine because it's only internal at the moment, but once we, our aspiration is to make the uh, application available externally to officers when they go out on site. So next week uh, the, the security of the application is going to improve to, make, to allow that to happen. Thank you very much. I mean, the reason this ended up at scrutiny in the first place was I recall the chairman of licensing asking the cabinet member well over a year ago at full council, do we have an issue coming with Assure? And was told quite mockingly, no, we don't have an issue coming. And then we quickly discovered we did have an issue coming. Basically, my question is going to be this, are we on top of this now? It's a simple question. Yes, I'd say so. Absolutely. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Bain. The 31st of March deadline is just a D support, which means if we experience any problems with the M3 system that we're currently using, unfortunately NEC will no longer support us, so we'd be left on our own. Uh, it may only be a small problem and we could exist with it, but obviously there could be a major issue. Um, that could cause us a significant problem. So it's best to try and transition as quickly as we can and not operate within M3 that's no, no longer supported. So it can continue and environmental health will continue past that. We need to get licensing over first. 
um, but we will transition the rest as soon as possible. But yeah, it's not a switch off and, and that's it. It just means that if there was any niggles or issues with the system, we can't go to NEC for support. We don't believe so, no. I mean, it, it, it is purely a case of um, NEC not providing any support for fix or fixes uh, or updates for M3 system uh, following the D support notice. So I don't believe there's any legal implications. We can, can, we can continue to use the system. We're still licensed to use the system uh, after uh, the end of March, which is literally the support. It's literally the support. It's not the stuff we're missing. The license, sorry, the license doesn't stop. No, no, we're licensed to use the system uh, after the end of March. It's, it's purely the support that NEC provide to us. Basically, if we break it, we're on our own. <laughs> uh, can I, can I um, make a request that for our meeting on the 7th of March, a briefing notice just sent with an update, because obviously that'll be a month closer to that point, and we'll know probably a bit further. I'm not asking for any officer attendance or anything. I'm just saying if a briefing note could be sent for that meeting, just have it as an agenda item just for us yeah. quickly to discuss. Uh, committee comfortable with that? Because obviously that's uh, almost at the cut-off date, so we'll just know exactly that we're on top of this. I'd be grateful if that could be done. Any further questions or comments? Is there a plan B if we need support after? Thank you for the support. I think ultimately um, NEC will provide <laughs> support if we pay them. Like, it, it just won't be part of our existing support agreement. We'd have to discuss that with them. But I'm guessing if you know uh, if it came to it, then we'd have to you know, we'd have to fund some support from them. It wouldn't be part of our existing support agreement. Mr. Barrett, Th thanks. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's it's important that we know they're not turning the system off. It's just if there is an issue with it, there will be no updates to it. So, you know, the, the system, he says, touching wood and crossing its legs has been largely um, successful over, over the years. So I don't see that changing in, in a short period of time. But that doesn't really stop us from actually trying to achieve that. The, yeah, well, making sure we achieve the, the date of the 31st, because it's always better to have support on the system than not. Thank you, Mr Barrett. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Bain. We do have a test system that we're working in at the moment, so everything's going on to the test system to check that it works before it will go on to the, the live system. Um, and then when we go live, licensing, the NEC have said for whatever reason, lic licensing has to go first. So licensing will transition over and the rest of environmental health will still be using M3. So yeah, we'll be running two systems for, for a while. So. But it's just beneficial for us to move as quickly as we can, just in case there are any issues, we'll get supported. Um, but also, as well, going forward, the sooner we're on the other system, the better, because if there's any changes in legislation or anything we've got to regulate that's new, M3 won't support that, so I'm sure will do. Okay, at which point, then, can I move a motion for just this committee that we endorse the progress made and thank the officers for the update? Thank you, Councillor Bain. All those in favour? It's carried, thank you. And I thank the officers for that and the reassurance on the progress made. Thank you. Again, if anybody wants to leave us, go enjoy your evenings. <laughs> not, not you, not you, no. Talk about updates. Always at the wrong time. Okay, just give it a second while the mass exodus takes place. Okay, I'll take us to item nine, working group updates. Obviously, as we're aware, as I mentioned earlier, our damp and mould recommendations were accepted by Cabinet, as we discussed earlier. 
obviously we had two parts to our working group looking at uh, housing repairs and damper mold we've ticked off the damper mold issue for now obviously the other side is the housing repairs i did send out a briefing note that mr weston kindly pulled together yesterday i'm not sure everybody's had a lot to go through i really want to thank mr weston because it was incredibly detailed a lot of data to go through Obviously, I've invited Mr. Mans and Mr. Weston here this evening. My recommendation is that obviously we can ask some opening questions now, anything we want to pull into the working group. Then we've got a month till our next meeting. And I, I would suggest as a working group and as a committee, we get stuck in for the next month, get our questions raised, get our concerns raised, swap some emails with Mr. Barnes and Mr. Weston. And then uh, we actually put this on as the main agenda item for the 7th of March when the working groups had a month to really get on teams, get in conversations, go to the pub. You know it works. So, uh, yeah, obviously shared some data. Um, Mr. Weston kindly pulled together. There's the KPI data, uh, there's outline progress, uh, number of complaints listed in stages. Um, there's comments uh, from the contact centre. Uh, some of the earlier questions that were raised by scrutiny I put on there, and Mr. Weston has done his best answer that they're in there. Obviously, I only circulate that yesterday, so I'm not sure anybody's a real proper go at perusing it. So let's not try and rush anything this evening. But we do have the officers here. If there's any opening thoughts anybody wants to raise, and then I'll suggest we get some dates in the diary to sit down amongst ourselves, leading on to a month from now. Is everybody comfortable with that? Okay. Open the floor. Any questions to kick us off? Please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Obviously, just looking at the KPI thing uh, sheet, um, are the council happy with what they're seeing on that sheet? Um, because I'm looking at it, and uh, especially the complete within 24 hours, that line hasn't been touched. So I'm just seeing what the council think. Uh, you know, are you happy with what you're seeing on that? I think fair to say there's definitely room for improvement. Uh, I think it's all fair to say. Because of the timescales on this, I wasn't able to do any filtering of that data. The reality of it is there will always be some jobs that won't be completed within 24 hours because the nature of the work is such that it would never be possible to complete within 24 hours. So there'll be jobs on there where they've perhaps gone out and boarded the window, had to measure glass and come back two or three days later to put the glass in. Well, clearly, you know, the initial attendance would have been within that 24 hours, but the job won't have been completed within 24 hours. When we do the sort of the detailed reports for KPIs, we do have an exceptions list attached to it that effectively picks out some of those jobs that sort of says, realistically, we're never going to complete that within 24 hours because of the nature of the works. Uh, similarly with the first time fix, I think we've, we've, we've had the conversation around first time fix before. That looks as though it may be a KPI that sort of as part of the tenant satisfaction measure that are measured as part of the sort of the, the wider national reporting may actually be taken out of the reporting because it's so vague in terms of interpretation. Uh, and again, I think, you know, we've said before on this one, for something like a window, we might class first time fixers, they go out, they board the window up and then do a follow on job to reglaze it. So the board up was that first time fix. From a tenant's perception, that wasn't first time fixed because they've had more than one visit. So I think that there is interpretation in there and I think that's, that's something that we, we're always going to get. So I think if we're looking at sort of more detailed reports, what we would want to do is actually go through some of those exceptions and sort of say, well, actually, on that, you know, the, there were some where you t you'd take them out. I think you do have to also look at the scale on the report because uh, whilst it looks like it's quite a bit below the line, actually, it's it, the range is only 88 to 100 percent. So it's not, you know, it's not from zero to 100 uh, percent. I think the average across the board is about 97 percent completed within that 20, 24 hours, which, bearing in mind, none of the exceptions have been taken out of it. Is there or thereabouts? Uh, like I say, always room for improvement. I think across the five days and the 26 days, most of those were broadly on target. First time fix actually isn't too bad, all things considered. Uh, when you know, like I say, when you look at the reality of what is first time fix and is it, you know, that holding repair, sort of, you know, the make safe and then you follow on afterwards, or is it the final job? Uh, and like I say, I think important on recalls, the lower the number, the better on that one, uh, because you actually don't want recalls if you can help it. So I think, you know, uh, I think we set an 8% figure because that sort of seems fairly much industry standard, but like I say, your aim is to get lower than that. If, if I could, Chair, just to add, so I, th I think in terms of sort of answering your question, I, I think the 
um, you know, your question is, are we satisfied with the performance of the contractor? And, and the answer to that is no. You know, the, the clearly there's some areas where the contractor has really got to do an awful lot better. Um, I think what we have to bear in mind, and again, there is context to this. So, you know, relatively speaking, the majority of repairs go very well. Um, relatively speaking, you know, the, the service is delivered in accordance with the specification, but wherever there, there are those um, opportunities for improvement, then, you know, we, we've got to work with the contractor to, to ensure that, you know, the improvements are made. I think um, what we, we actually met with the contractor earlier today, Paul and myself, and, and quality and improvement was on the agenda. Um, and one of the things that we, we've now got in place with the contractor is the development of a, an improvement plan. Um, so those specific areas where we've got concerns and where we think th think things need to improve, um, you know that that will be form part of an improvement plan that will be specific, measured, measurable, um, and you know that that's certainly something that we've got a commitment from the contractor to co collaborate with us. I think the other thing I would say is that it's not always about the contractor. Sometimes it's about making all of the systems from the call centre through the repairs team and the contract and making sure that all of that is working uh, seamlessly. So, you know, there are improvements to be made throughout. But I think, you know, what, what we don't want to do is sort of have any point at which we're sitting here and saying, you know, we, we're kind of either apologists for the, for the contractor or saying, you know, no, everything is perfect, everything is great. Because clearly, we all know from the experience of the relatively small cases, a number of cases, but a uh, small number of cases with a really high impact on the individual customer that things don't always work in the way that we would like them to so you know we are working very proactively with the contractor and i think we have good commitment from the contractor to work with us to uh, to see improvement not just across these kpis but throughout all the issues of quality on the on the um, on the contract and on the service thank you yeah just add to that from my own perspective um as i've said in many committee meetings if you pull it out there for the sake of argument 16,000 repairs a year if you get 97 percent kpi which in any industry is 97 percent is a good percentage uh, you're looking at you know 48 issues per ward does that sound right on everybody's phone and email log i bet it does actually you know and all of a sudden those 48 sound like a lot but when you put it against 16,000, there's a reality to it but that doesn't mean as has rightly been expressed we can't improve and i think that's what we're discussing here I mean, I'll always remember uh, a former chief executive of this council, David Webberley, once saying, in private industry, if you hit 97%, you get a bonus. In the public sector, you hit 97%, all anybody says is, what about the 3%? And there's a reality of what local government is when you think about it that way. Any further questions or comments for this evening? Councillor Bain. Uh, for our working group, can we get a copy of the improvement plan? I was, I was just going to say, and I, I think that's that's absolutely right because you know nine times out of ten, the stuff that ends up um, you know in my inbox, it's it's not so much that you know it's not so much the quality of work or anything. It's simply that that issue of communication, and that can come you know there can be a number of reasons why communication breaks down. Um, in, I was just going to say, in terms of that improvement plan, the work we're doing with the contractor, I think it would be very you know that would be something which I would suggest. You know, yourselves as a scrutiny committee obviously would welcome your your scrutiny of that. I think as well, one of the conversations we had with the contractor today was that, you know, again, they're very happy to be accountable to you, uh, to be engaging with you directly. So again, that may be something you wish to consider is actually sort of having the contractor in um, to so that they can sort of set out their stall. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, again, from many conversations we have with them, they are as committed to making sure that it's you know excellent service that we are improving you know as as we are so uh, yeah i think that would be very helpful thank you chair i think it's worth remembering as well the first time we ever um, 
put the um, housing repairs contract out to market. Our very first contract, if you recall, their computer system couldn't talk to our computer system, Orchard. And we've come a long way since those teething problems. Any further questions or comments? Okay, does it sound like a plan for everybody then? We look to start getting some dates in the diary, uh, start raising some questions, start getting through the data, looking to get it back in a month, challenge ourselves. Everybody comfortable? Okay, obviously uh, I'm sure our officers will make themselves available for emails and questions as we raise them and hopefully invite you back in about a month and see if we can get some progress. It is worth saying though, uh, this committee is doing this as a critical challenge, not because we think there's fundament anything fundamentally wrong with anything any officer is doing, I just want to put that on record. Okay, everybody comfortable? Excellent. Uh, next item on our agenda is the forward plan. Is there anything on the forward plan any member wishes to discuss or fetch forward to a future meeting? Nothing jumped out at me. Uh, so obviously the last thing on our agenda is the work plan. Obviously our next meeting is the 7th of March. Uh, as we said, we'll put housing repairs on there as the main item. Uh, the update on Assure, as yeah. a briefing note for a quick discussion. Has anybody got anything absolutely pending they want to put on there? Councillor Maycock. Just thinking if officers are looking for a scrutiny committee to take on the asset management plan. I think, we got I think, I think it's with ISAG. Is it about yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Sound like an agenda everybody can buy into? Excellent. In that case then, I'll close the meeting, thank the officers for attendance, and wish everybody a good evening. Thank you.